welcome everybody, a small group today, to, uh, to our next Pearl Diver seminar. Uh, we are recording, so uh, others will catch up, uh, I'm sure. Uh, today's topic that uh, will be delivered uh, for us by, by Professor Hera Dezeu is actually um, a central topic for our, our, our uh, seminar series. Because in the seminar series, we are um, discussing, it's not in itself like a research process going on in the seminars, but we are discussing the intersection or interplay between what we, uh, what we come to understand from our research and our academic discussions uh, that, that we are uh, involved in, uh, in kind of like a more interdisciplinary context than uh, uh, only focus on education, but we have a lot of input, uh, inputs and um, concepts, theories, understandings that, that are coming from, from academic research. So this is one side. Another side is we are, we are setting up and we are designing and, and implementing educational activities. So those two sides, uh, today will be approached by, uh, by Herard uh, in, uh, as, a, as, as something between which there is a gap or a hole. Uh, and the topic is bridging the gap or escaping the hole. And uh, we are pointing the direction that there is like no such a, such a uh, maybe obvious and unproblematic match one-to-one -one between what we, what we think we're, we want to do and, and what we are doing in educational context. So, so Herat, the floor is yours. Uh, recording is set up, so. Uh, Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to talk about this topic. The original stimulus to uh, your invitation was, in fact, that uh, I sent you a paper, uh, which is actually called Gap or Hole. So uh, it was a topic that um, arose out of the fact that uh, for a very long time I've been engaged in various aspects of uh, teaching and education. Uh, one, one is that I, for a while, was professor of adult educa education, which is, of course, a little bit different than the usual type of education. But even so, some of the principles apply to it as well. Um, the other uh, aspect is that um, in other periods of my life, I was uh, strongly engaged and uh, interacting with the Center for uh, Center for Research in Education. <laughs> I have to translate because the name is Dutch. Um, <clears throat> and in that center, um, there was one gentleman, uh, Jan Timmer who um, at the time um, was dealing with a certain type of problem and uh, wanted to write his PhD about it. Uh, and I was supervisor. So there are a number of interactions between me and the topic. Um, Jan Timmer unfortunately died in 2017 and uh, wasn't able to finish his PhD um, which doesn't mean that it was complete, but it means that uh, most of the material was in there. So there is a clear connection between me and the topic. Even so, I don't claim that I am um, an expert in uh, education, um, but I do have a contact in the world of um, education, Hank Slichten, who is, uh, used to be, uh, he's now retired, but he's still active, a uh, member of the Kohnstam Institute, which is the research, uh, uh, the most uh, well-known research institute in the Netherlands. Um, so the problem that Jan Timmer tried to engage with um, is called the gap in the literature. Later on, I added the notion of a hole because it's not very clear whether uh, the gap is not actually a hole that people fall into. 
and uh, many people experience as a black hole, they never come out of it. So um, there are a number of different definitions of what, a, of what a gap is, but one of them is that what teachers want, researchers cannot provide. But the more simple, more operational one is that it is noted that very few teachers, to be precise, 8% of them, claim that they once in a while look at a research paper or have a conversation with a researcher. Uh, the number is a little bit higher with those uh, who are in being educated as a teacher, then it's 74%. 74 but then apparently after that, they forget that there is a possible relation with education and research, between education and research. The topic <coughs> is not a new one. Um, it actually started in the uh, 1960s, when for the first time, um, people started to be very much interested in applying research and and acquire knowledge to use in education. That doesn't mean that there weren't very intellectual people who developed and improved uh, education, but not via research. So in that sense, uh, it is, you might say, mainly from the 1960s. Um, but the papers that are being published on the topic uh, continue from that time on. So Jan Timmer was publishing on the topic, uh, but for example, Boekamp and Boekamp and Van den Hout uh, published a paper in 2006, in 2009, and at the moment uh, with the Novis Institute, a lot of papers are being published uh, by people like Bista. Um, who is professor of education, obviously. <laughs> um, and they all claim that the problem hasn't been solved, even though at the same time, they think that the problem has been solved. So um, there is a bit of a competition between various people uh, on whether or not the problem has been solved. It is uh, quite... Uh, complex type of problem. And people realize, of course, that um, education is a complex system. Um, there are lots of people involved in it. There are teachers, managers, financiers, pupils, parents. So many people are involved in it. And also schools. Um, are different in the Netherlands. Uh, they satisfy, they have to satisfy the same criteria, but the way they are organized is very different locally. Also, there are a large number of different schools. So um, when you have a, a law that says that certain schools must satisfy certain types of, or as the government is saying, must make use of the knowledge of the research, <laughs> then everybody is interpreting it in a different way. So in that sense, um, uh, you might say that not only is the situation complex, but obviously um, there is a problem with research. You can't deny that. Part of the problem is, of course, that very little money is uh, spent on research in education. Little money, very little doesn't mean not in the millions, but it's only 0.1% uh, of the expenses for education which go into the billions in the Netherlands. So it's quite a large amount of money. Uh, when I was involved in this type of situation, um, there was a, a research institute called SVO, Stichting for Onderzoek, Onder, Onderwijs Onderzoek. And they got uh, 30 million to spend. And at the end of that 30 million, 
the evaluation was that um, no noticeable results, uh, changes in education had been achieved. So it's in a sense, not a small problem, but it's a problem where everybody has an interpretation. Um, so in that sense, uh, you might say, well, what are people doing? Um, are there any uh, applications of um, research? Well, the main difficulty, of course, is that uh, there are lots of people who do things, and it's not always very clear whether that is research or not. Um, there is a project, for example, in Rotterdam. It's called um, Small Scale Deficiency Support. <laughs> Deficiency Support. So it supports people who have difficulty learning. Um, they have developed a number of guides that the teachers can use with a lot of examples and uh, suggestions to do that. So you might say that is not very clear. It's not very clear whether that is research. Usually research is considered to be something uh, that is large scale, at least in the Netherlands, that is evidence-based. Um, and the only thing that you can say about this project is that it works. So it's an evaluation. It is not necessarily a very clear explanation of why it works. Well, I come back to that, but it is useful to uh, notice that um, there are a number of different approaches. So some of them actually um, have received names. <laughs> Do you see something? Yes, you see yes, something. It's, it's good. Well, uh, Bruckerman van Hout Wolters in 2006 uh, wrote a study and a summary of what is going on in this area to uh, bridge the gap. And one of them is the research development diffusion model. model. Um, it is strictly focused on the scientific method. It identifies prototypes with full control over the variables, simple experiments. Then people are experimenting them until one is uh, satisfied with the final product. The evidence-based practice is one of the most popular, um, and it makes very often use of random control trials, which means that you have to have a number of different schools, uh, divide them into two parts, uh, and use one the method that you wish to study in one, and something else in the other. Um, then you have the possibility of getting uh, focusing on the fact that research and education are activity system, uh, systems where people are interacting and trying to collaborate and where they, by doing so, develop individual and collective competence. And finally, uh, the most popular at the moment, um, knowledge community where members attempt to co-create because one of the uh, diagnosis uh, that was made is that many of the teachers actually do not read uh, research papers, so you can't blame them for not knowing about them. So you must uh, inform them and get them to read them and discuss it and uh, possibly criticize it in a number of ways. So um, the first two are clearly identified as based on the uh, standard uh, form of inquiry. You want to have knowledge, you want to test it, you want to identify the variables that de define it, and uh, you want to actually uh, consider, interpret uh, interventions in research uh, as objects that you can compare. Both of these messages have a lot of, uh, can be very clearly criticized. 
The second type is quite different. It is realized that <clears throat> education is a social system and that in that system, uh, some people are competent, other people aren't, and that <clears throat> uh, interaction between them um, is extremely important. Um, I have given my example in a number of situations. I taught uh, girls 12 to 13 years when I was a student, and I didn't do very well until an, one of the older teachers came to me and said, there is one secret to go, good teaching, and I'm going to tell you. And after that, of course, I was a good teacher. <laughs> And the, the secret is, if there is um, disturbance somewhere in the classroom, you have to look somewhere else. Never, <laughs> never at where the problem is. Wow. <laughs> I applied that and no problem anyway. Um, there are good uh, arguments for that, of course. Um, so this suggests that uh, there are a number of, this identifies that there are a number of people working on uh, the gap. Um, over time, uh, more, many people have identified that what is important in bridging the gap is presumably mainly um, the communication between uh, teachers, students, pupils, um, but it isn't quite clear um, what communication is. Um, there are extremely many uh, proposals, for example, to uh, stop the war in the Ukraine by having uh, Russia and Ukraine um, talk to each other. And it, to me, that seems like a very um, um, uh, well, not very effective <coughs> type of conversation. Um, so, at the moment, many of the problems in the world they always claim that you have to talk to each other, but um, there is conversation and conversation and before you really are able to converse, you have to develop the art of conversation. And that is still a hidden field. So um, Jan Timmer <clears throat> at the time was uh, becoming aware of this uh, gap problem. He was um, trained as a mathematician, but went to on to teach mathematics in secondary schools. So his main area is teaching in secondary schools. But then he became a member of um, the, uh, uh, the SEO, the Stichting Centrum Onderwijs Onderzoek, the uh, Institute for uh, on Educational Research. And he became also a member of my group, which is the Center for Innovation and Technological uh, development and collaborative development. Um, and he started to apply some of the things that he encountered in his work. So one of the, so I'm going now to give a few, a number of examples of what he did. And after that, I will uh, discuss uh, what I think he did. So there is a project that is called the Eatonbank project. It ran from 67, so it's a long time ago, but it, it still is quite an, a useful example. Um, in the Netherlands, we have a number of different types of education, MAVO, HAVO, VWO, and <clears throat> um, I've been teaching, for example, on the LBO as well, um, which is a technical education, lower technical uh, education. Um, one of the students I had there was very bad in mathematics in the previous teacher. And then I gave him some extra material. And 20 years later, 
he approached me on the station and said, I have now a PhD in mathematics. <laughs> it was an interesting interaction. But anyway, at the time um, in the 70s, um, De Groot was uh, a major entrepreneur in uh, research and in education. And he suggested that all the pupils had to be tested uh, at the age of 12, 11, to identify uh, which of them would have certain abilities. And so they could group these pupils in, to steer them into either MAFO, HAFO, PVO, or LBO, and, and a number of others. So it was an, um, a selection process. And um, he advocated the idea that once people have been uh, selected and put together because they have similar apt uh, aptitudes, um, there shouldn't be a selection, there should be a selection free period um, where they are not uh, selected, but they can as a group continue their education. Um, <clears throat> that I, I have been involved with that as well. Um, it was not be because I was uh, particularly interested in testing, but it was, you know, um, the standard topic for everybody who was in psychology. Um, the next point, the conflict arose and the teachers objected to the characteristics on which the selection of would be would be based. Uh, they used the term conflict, even the term coup. They saw education as primarily as a way to help pupils change themselves. And the test did not include this aspect. So these uh, conflicts uh, were extremely severe. Um, people were calling each other names, uh, the papers, the journals. Um, so <clears throat> Jan Timmer, as a member of uh, SEO, um, tried to help the diffuse uh, the conflict. And he um, suggested that the teachers should actually develop their own tests. So if they wanted something else, they should test for something else. Um, uh, this involved, for example, that uh, one, some of the prerogative of teachers, that is that they have full control over the items would also share and that the teachers would have the right to develop the item collections for the test. Uh, and they could select item to construct special purpose tests and not items. And the interesting thing is that uh, uh, conflicts disappeared. So, Two types of results were achieved. It proved possible to help the teachers to do research. That is quite an interesting issue. It was possible to simplify the uh, methods for research in such a way that people don't actually do them and, and enjoy them. Uh, my main point is that <clears throat> The knowledge was not the type of knowledge that is usually identified in uh, the standard scientific method, but it took the form of guidelines to construct diagnostic tests. So the teachers were allowed via the guidelines to take items out of the item bank, construct diagnostic tests such that they could help the pupils to test themselves whether they were realizing the goals they had formulated and were allowed to modify. So this meant that um, self-activity, self-organization was introduced in, in the concept, both for the teachers and for the pupils. Um, and the interesting thing, of course, is that it worked. It also worked in the sense that um, um, the financiers accepted Jan's proposal. So they didn't realize that it was quite different from the standard method. 
I hope you see that it is quite different, but we'll come back to that. Um, the major point to help the students was, of course, that there had to be teaching material. There was basic and extra, and uh, the students were able, were allowed to decide to go for extra on the basis of the results of their diagnostic test. The educational system itself didn't change, of course. You still had HAVO, MAVO, and all, all these things. Um, but at the same time, uh, students could move upwards. For example, HBS at the time was lower than PVO. Uh, PVO is uh, preparing for the university. And if they were good enough, they could go to the university. So teachers and students were quite happy. Of course, over time, um, some of this has disappeared as happens very often. Uh, teachers started to trust um, the item bank, so they used the same tests every time and the variety in the test disappeared. Well, not, not completely, but you understand what I'm saying. The major point was that it made it possible to actually help the students, pupils, to move within the school system from, let us say, less uh, exacting uh, topics to more exacting topics. Um, there was another project. Um, I'm not, I have a number of projects, but you get probably uh, the type of um, secondary school uh, education in the Netherlands was a difficult thing um, because there were so many different types of school and some of them were expected to teach especially in the creative, creative artistic, technical and social skills. Um, unfortunately, uh, Parliament approved principles on its own. It said these schools have to, have to do what we say, whereas the original proposal was to actually develop a plan for this type of school. So that was a dilemma. Do we do the research now or don't we? Um, again, I have to identify the fact that people were very, very unhappy about this type of uh, intervention. And um, so you might still say that there is a problem because the type of research that was proposed couldn't continue and something else had to be done, even though the culprit was parliament. Um, it took three months, uh, but that was not the major problem. Um, again, Jan Timmer, introduced a proposal and what he said was let us assume um, that the principles that parliament has prepared are up for criticism so let us continue by having a research project where we actually uh, try to identify criticisms of the principles of the parliament uh, in this case, supported by uh, evidence. The major point here is that uh, it made it possible for teachers um, to again do research themselves. It was not research done by Jan Timmer or by some organization, but it left the doing of the research to the teachers who had to be instructed, of course, um, but they, the instructions included um, intensive discussions with interviewees and having interviewees discuss um, the results from previous uh, subjects um, so that uh, in fact, it was very much like, um, a type of research. It proved possible to provide, to formulate such uh, instructions. And um, the whole project 
led to very uh, intensive discussions within the schools, even though um, nothing really changed. But I think it is an interesting project uh, because it actually helped teachers talk about schools, whereas most of the time, most teachers do not talk about schools. They talk about um, their topic or they talk about problems with uh, individual pupils, but not about uh, the general overall uh, construction and organization of the educational system. Um, there was a similar project. Um, and uh, it was claimed that the researchers imposed their ideas and that these uh, teachers were not listened to. It's a very well-known situation, so it's not really uh, anything new, but the whole point is, of course, that uh, it was considered uh, a type of problem and that a research project was designed to deal with it. Um, so the challenge to formulate method that could support the integration between the different uh, parties. Um, and again, the conflict disappeared. The major point, the major difficulty that arose from this project that was suggested in this project is that there were a lot of suggestions, but the suggestions couldn't be uh, treated as observations. So when you say, for example, uh, there should be more uh, time spent to introduce a topic, um, that, that is very difficult to say, uh, to consider it as an observation. So from this project, it was learned that when uh, teachers did the research, or pupils did the, uh, did the work themselves, uh, sometimes they had to made, make uh, uh, decisions, but the decisions couldn't be made on the same, in the same way that usually decisions are made in research. So you couldn't say, I have two observations and I can see that they both refer to the same object, and to the same property variable, uh, but there is a little bit of a difference because of the individual observers. Here, you had to do something uh, different, and that was what was being learned in this project. Combine them in sets of elements, such that you can say that the elements are related, but not such that you can say that the set of suggestions is a categorization. If necessary, I can come back to the notion of a categorization. Um, include developed social skill, introductory periods, help us to get used to period matter. And so very important part of these uh, sets was that they suggested uh, that uh, it is important not to simply introduce uh, an intervention but to help the, those who are going to introduce the intervention uh, become um, situated, become uh, well aware of the properties of the situation. So in that sense, um, uh, I think I missed one example, but it doesn't matter. So, the notion that uh, Jan Timmer introduced here uh, is twofold. Um, I hope you can see it in these examples. First of all, he said um, the traditional way of doing uh, research implies that you um, acquire knowledge about things that are well defined about things that, you know, you might say this is a, a book, or you might say this is a book on mathematics, and then you might identify the properties. But he introduced the notion of a half product. He said, suppose we look at a book, 
um, then there are actually um, auras around it uh, dependent on who is going to use it. So somebody might say, the book to me implies reading. Another uh, might say, the book to me implies doing exercises in mathematics. A third might say, the book to me implies, implies um, uh, building up a library. And obviously there is also the possibility of burning them. So his notion was half product. The product is not a final product, but it's something that can be modified uh, dependent on its use. And so he said, whatever the teachers are doing has to be modified um, because for each pupil, uh, the book is not the same and the teaching material is not the same. So they deviate from the intended uh, definition of the object and they create variation. And what you have to do is to um, uh, help the pupils uh, to use that variation for their own purpose. So help them use the variation to develop themselves and of course the teachers as well. So the major point there is that any object is not an object, but it is an object in use. And different uses um, have to be compared, but they are not going to be uh, clearly categorizable. So there is no category where you can say, this is what the set means, but you can say, this is within the domain um, of the set that the set identifies. So first things are not considered to be things, but are considered to be things in use. Secondly, you can collect different types of things in use and you can identify that they belong together and that there is what might be called a frame within the uh, operate. So Jan Timmer uh, based himself on this principle where he said, I want the teachers to do things in research where they actually are able to create the variation and use the variation for their own purposes and the same for the pupil and the same for the managers. Um, that is of course quite an ambitious type of project, but in the examples, I hope I have demonstrated that at least on the level of schools, he was quite uh, successful. Now you might say, uh, okay, that's his interpretation. Is there a more general interpretation? And the more general interpretation, of course, is um, which I would like to present as something that um, has been developed. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, one of my PhD students uh, also worked on this gap and developed what I'm going to say now. Um, and he got his PhD, he completed his PhD in 2021, so recent. <laughs> um, the point that is being made is, let us start with, um, let us start with traditional science. What does it do? Well, um, in the def traditional definition that uh, started with Galileo, uh, the aim is to identify patterns in the events that uh, occur around us, to observe um, the pat uh, these patterns and to find patterns in the observations. I should have made it a better formulation. To observe patterns in the observations of the uh, reality that surrounds us. Um, that has been very effective. Um, it has led to all the developments that um, are traditional in uh, physics, in traditional physics. Uh, obviously, there were some difficult problems in quantum mechanics, but the main idea is still, you try to identify the objects that you want to identify the properties of. But that means that you actually do two things, and that's the interesting thing that I wish to present. 
you say, in essence, uh, you are free to do whatever you want to do with uh, your environment, but I will tell you only about certain things, and the rest you have to do yourself. You are free to use, for example, if you wish to throw a ball, you are free to use it, um, <clears throat> and you know and you can predict certain uh, outcomes. It uh, follows a um, parabola, so you can predict uh, different positions in the parabola. Um, so you're free to use the predictions, but this is called the mechanistic metaphor. The mechanistic metaphor makes it only possible to tell you something about reality that follows the mechanistic metaphor. So everything that is outside of that metaphor um, cannot be uh, studied. There are no patterns in it. And so the major difficulty is, and that's what Jan Timmer called variation, the major difficulty is that uh, the things that standard science is exploring is so well defined that there is no variation in it. Only when you allow uh, users to actually use the things, they add variation. So you might say it in the reverse way, any object in reality is a constraint on the freedom of an individual. So you might say, well, that's an interesting metaphor, okay. Um, but what about situations where according to the mechanistic metaphor, there are no patterns? And obviously there are many situations where there are no patterns. You know, um, when you see people uh, walking in a field, for example, they change, um, they do not follow a clear pattern. Um, and so you might say that's interesting because it identifies an area of study that is extremely wide where <clears throat> we don't know what the variety is, the variation is that people can produce. So how can we study it? Well, in the, um, I'm sorry that I'm giving a lecture, but I thought it was nice to make a change rather than, uh, you, we can discuss a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> so in, in, in the Second World War, a number of people realized this difficulty of finding knowledge about things that do not show a pattern. So if there is no pattern, you have a lot of freedom. But the freedom doesn't matter given the, uh, the pattern, so you, you can do anything with that pattern. Um, so they developed something which is uh, quite interesting. For example, they developed um, decision theory. They said, let us, do, let us not take the scientific method as a mechanistic metaphor, but let us take it as a decision-making metaphor, which means that if I use that metaphor, I can only see people making decisions. Everything else is invisible. So I can study their behavior when they make decisions. And that has, of course, led to quite an extensive area of study um, which you probably all know a little bit about because Kahneman uh, got the Nobel Prize for it and um, wrote a book that is very well known. Um, so it is possible to say, for example, when you uh, get to choices, what do people do? Uh, they do this or they do that. And you can identify, for example, different moral difficulties. Uh, you know, um, either I do something and one person gets killed, or I do something and 20 persons can, can get killed. Which do you prefer? And so on. These are the typical decision uh, making um, problems that have been identified, that have been presented to people. So you can say, in the decision-making uh, metaphor, the experimental setup 
implies giving people decision-making problems, identifying what they do, comparing these uh, what they do, and creating something that is might be called the knowledge of making decisions. The knowledge of making decisions is, of course, constrained by the fact that it is about this metaphor, just as the knowledge of uh, mechanisms is constrained by the fact that I can only look at mechanisms. So there are other metaphors that developed in that period. For example, uh, cybernetics says, in fact, whatever it is that you are interested in, you must be interested in the way that feedback is modifying your behavior. Now, within that metaphor, um, there are clear conclusions to clear ways to identify what it is that you see, but outside of that metaphor, you're still free. So given these different examples, I now come to the conclusion that it is possible to uh, do science on things that are not patterns on events that are not patterns. What you have to do is introduce a constraint, just as the scientific method introduces a constraint, which is the mechanistic metaphor. So the main difficulty in identifying ways of uh, helping teachers to teach is, in fact, to give them a proper metaphor to do that. And Jan Timmer did so by saying, Good Lord, um, if you don't want to do the test, have the test done by, this, uh, by the um, researchers, you can do them yourselves. And that was such a startling idea <laughs> that the, the teachers actually enjoyed it. They considered it a challenge. And um, I, I remember some of it uh, were very happy about it. Um, they learned something. They weren't really very good at it. They needed some advice and support. But at the same time, uh, it changed their entire lives because now they had control over the results, over the knowledge that they were going to acquire about the teaching situation. So in that sense, you might say the main point about uh, being able to, know, to acquire knowledge is to introduce metaphors such that you identify precisely what it is you are looking for and what it is you are not looking for. In the scientific metaphor, you look at everything that is a mechanism. In the decision-making uh, metaphor, you look at everything that is a decision. In the um, cybernetic metaphor, you look at everything that is part of a process in which feedback plays an important role. And when you do that, um, you are able to actually acquire knowledge about things that do not show pattern. And the major point is, of course, that even as you do in the scientific method, you introduce the patterns yourself. It's not reality that defines the pattern, it's you who is defining the pattern. And in the case of the mechanistic metaphor, of course, it's well known that um, reality doesn't really know that it is a metaphor, that is it a me mechanism. It just behaves as if it is happy to uh, help you realize that it is a metaphor. And so in many situations, people are actually quite willing to help you uh, consider that um, if you constrain them, in, uh, for example, to the decision-making metaphor, they are quite happy to tell you what freedom they still enjoy. So there is a very clear um, process in which you can do what Jan Timmer did. And it's more or less like this. The method is intended to help anyone who wishes to ignore in, in the form of connected centers do instructions. Do instructions are uh, do this or do that as a means to support systematizing on actions, becoming clear about one's goal, finding local resources, identifying deviation. May we wish to help oneself as well as others. Advice <clears throat> the design is that you take a number of uh, subjects 
you put them in a constraint, for example, decision making, and then you ask them uh, about their reaction to that particular situation. You collect the reports, you uh, work on them uh, to identify how they are related, and if necessary, you repeat the whole process. Now, what's interesting about this design, I think, is that it emphasizes the freedom of humans that you study, but it might be pigs as well, the freedom uh, to do whatever they want, but constrained by something in the environment that you introduce. So the interesting change in the model of man is that you are no longer talking about men, but you are talking about men in an environment and the environment can be changed and if you change the environment then the human changes so anybody who is um, an expert in boolean logic of course can be constrained may wish to be constrained him or herself to be a boolean logician and if you want to have conversations it is possible to identify um constraints, sets of ways of doing that, such that all of these uh, elements, these ways of doing, are connected by some axioms. So there is a set of axioms in the literature, I won't go into that, there's a set of axioms to actually help you uh, cooperate, um, there is a set of actions, of course, to uh, do standard uh, scientific research. It implies um, the notion of a scientific, uh, of the mechanistic metaphor. So instead of being confined to one scientific method, you're now free to actually understand that it is a way of finding patterns whenever it is not or is possible to find patterns. Well, um, that is how I would think about um, uh, the gap in education. This PhD student of mine and I are writing a book at the moment um, to introduce to students a lot of examples and exercises to become able to use uh, research in this wider sense, to either use it in the standard sense or to use it in another sense with different types of metaphor. I think that is spoken long enough. So I hope you, uh, well, some of you are still not asleep. But, uh, not that is the end of my contribution. Uh, the the examples that you are giving, um, it seems because you, it, it, they they are placed in a particular times, which is like seventies and eighties. But like to my knowledge, the same thing is going over and over and over in educational projects. And I was witnessing for a few years, just lately, maybe not in the last few, like five years, but it was like around five years ago, a, a major project in Poland. Uh, that actually the father of our players in the game, uh, Grzegorz, was was uh, uh, leading on a like uh, in the whole country. It was for all schools in Poland, and it was commissioned by the the ministry. And they uh, and it was our department then in Krakow that was tasked with it, and and Grzegorz was dealing with it. So they uh, they have designed the new uh, like the whole new setup for educational evaluation for uh -huh. teachers and schools and programs for everything and everything was based basically on self-evaluation and the fact okay so it was the there was training in self-evaluation development of of criteria application of criteria a kind of assisted process which the the person who was assisting you would not come to evaluate you but to work with you your criteria and then you apply those criteria to yourself and then you like look at the results what you have uh, what you have uh, understood and how you how you plan to implement yourself and this very point you know that it was based on self-evaluation he has spent 
I don't know, like five years or more, just explaining this over and over. And it was so difficult and it was so contested because it, it felt, you know, in, in terms of like, it, it feels it's like so subjective that it cannot be a system. Yes? <laughs> uh, which is not true, yes, because like when you when you learn uh, to do that in a systematic way and you are assisted and those uh, and those processes aggregate and they are repeated and so on and so on, you basically have a like a like a country wide system of self reflection, which is increasingly like learning how to how to do that. But I remember uh, I, I wasn't very, very, very closely involved, but I remember this uh, this controversy yeah, about the self-assessment being the core of it. And the problem people had with it was was really immense. And it was, you know, like it, you, because otherwise you, you could you could say, oh, OK, now, you know, it's it's different times, it's participatory type of research and, and more like in social sciences and more like subject. Uh, involvement in the process is different now, but uh, not 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 when it comes to kind of institutionalized processes. It might be that when you have like qualitative research as a, as a research project, you you would already uh, take like you you would shift with uh, with assignment of subject uh, like the value of subjectivity differently than it was like thirty years ago. But but in institutional processes, in management processes, it's like it 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 seems that it's as you know uh, it is now as it was in in Jan Timmer's uh, research you know times. <laughs> so yeah. this, this seems to me that, that still still the case. What? Uh... No, I think it's a quite a good example. Mm. Um, the project I described was because I wanted to show that um, Jan Timmer already at that time was thinking in this way. Yeah. Um, but meantime, in the meantime, there are lots of projects in the Netherlands. Um, another one of my PhDs is uh, was professor. <laughs> Uh, in one of the um, universities for um, uh, practical application, as they call it in the Netherlands. Uh, and she has now retired and is now working on one of these problems, projects, uh, writing a book about it, etc. So uh, the main point uh, that you make and that I would like to support is that there has been a uh, quite a substantial change over the last 20, 30 years in terms of what is allowed in uh, educational research. The point I would like to stress, however, is that it's not that there are many different ways of doing research. Um, the point I would like to stress is that each of these ways of research is actually a way of supporting the freedom of the individual. So you try to uh, propose a metaphor, do the research, but that means that the person is still free to use the results of that method. So um, in that sense, uh, scientific research is no longer different from the other types of metaphor. They are all the same type of metaphor but different constraints on individuals and therefore different ways of respecting your freedom. And I think that's uh, well suggested by Jan Timmer, but also developed, of course, later on, uh, quite an interesting way of looking at things that you can say, well, participatory research is, is not participatory research. It is research based on the metaphor of participation. <laughs> And so you can identify different ways of doing that. You can identify strategies, you can teach it, you can uh, develop a library in which you have these different strategies and so on. So suddenly it all becomes quite an interesting endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, can, I, uh, can I say something? Uh, can you please uh, un un uh, unshare the screen so I can see all of you? Just a moment, I will do that. Sorry, I... I... Yeah, I, I did it. Can you repeat it? I did it, can't you? It's, it's already done because there was still the, the shared screen, which was already empty. So. Ah, okay. So, oh. 
first I want to thank you for the illuminating uh, uh, talk. <clears throat> I have two questions, one of them with a smile and the second one is pretty, <laughs> is pretty more, uh, more involved. The, the one with the smile is something that I carried from, the, from more or less the beginning is how would you apply this teacher, uh, teacher's uh, secret that you were told uh, many years ago to, to a hybrid model with the, where the teaching situation is online and you cannot really look the other way. So what would be the equivalent in a online teaching situation? So this is, <laughs> this is my first uh, question. Okay. I don't know it, uh, but it sounds... Disconnect, uh, disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, actually, we need to develop a certain kind of a gesture mechanism to somehow implement it. But another question that comes up very much uh, in resonance with what you are, uh, were, what you were uh, presenting is that immediately I, will, I wanted to ask you and all of us, okay, so what are the metaphors that we would like to uh, put in place to describe our educational activity in the Buckminster uh, project? Yeah. Uh, one, example, one example that, that uh, uh, I think that I was discussing with Marta quite a few times, was something which, which is coming from a, from a, a, from the les, like three different kinds of of interactions between a, a, an instructor and a student. One of them, and each one of them is actually can be understood as a as as a metaphor in this uh, description that you give. The first one is. Um, is do what I say. So the instructor say to the pupil, do what I say. Um, the second, the, the second one is uh, observe and do what you see that I do. So this is the second one. And the third one, which is something that I would like to to develop, but I don't think it's trivial. The, the third metaphor is do with me. It's like a more cooperative uh, conversational uh, kind of interaction between the instructor and the, and the student. So these are like, in my, to my mind, are only preliminary, like preliminary uh, direction of developing developing new ideas, but I would like to hear you and may and also all of us just what kind of metaphors are, are we about to uh, would, can we fi find the interesting in the light of this in the light of this project of the Buckminster. So I think it's extremely important and it's a very fresh uh, kind of a perspective to think about the educational process in terms of the metaphors uh, and systems of constraints and degrees of freedom that are defining the whole situation of observation. It's, it, it actually creates a, a cognitive system, a cognitive system that incorporates the whole the agents that are involved, the processes that are involved, the definitions of boundaries and so on and so forth. So, yeah. um, and, and this moment is very important. This, this like, uh, I, I have a sense that with this seminar, we are actually opening the Pearl Diver series seriously. <laughs> yes, if we, if we like really start to reason about this process also as a research project, yes, a process. Yes. And what kind of like yes we we need to we need to discuss what patterns we want to observe and what kind of observers we want to be yes and it will be and and in this in this part like uh, something obviously like participatory because we want to teach simultaneously but we want it to be a research process in itself yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, well, I think it's a very uh, nice suggestion uh, Viva introduces, which is um, to, and as Marta identifies, to look at the uh, projects that we are doing as a research process and to look at what we are doing now as a research process as well. So I support that. Uh, so let me make my contribution to this. <clears throat> um, your first uh, um, uh, question, actually, um, it's an interesting question, obviously, but also very simple to answer. Um, but um, there are some uh, uh, connections to things that are less uh, simple. Simple is, of course, that when we are in... Uh, um, a meeting like this, we won't have uh, individual uh, pupils interacting with each other. So it's not a class situation. So the whole secret does not apply, in fact. On the other hand, I, now, there is a medium. There you is might. A medium, there is a medium that, like what we are doing now, everybody can can speak and yes. dispel everybody else. It's That's... just like I'm doing now. Okay, just to make the point, yes, but. Uh, so but the point is that in the classroom, uh, pupils have their own lives, so they interact with each other, and that's what teachers sometimes call a disturbance. Mm. And what I'm saying is, given the fact that you are not interacting, you are not disturbing. But then at the same time, you might say, well, that's okay, uh, we are not disturbing as a group collectively, but we can be disturbing as individuals. So why not apply to the, to the, the secret to the individual? And um, of course, that is precisely what, what I like to do when I give my um, discussion sessions in the um, School of Thinking, as you know. Um, so what I do, I create connections between the different individuals. I say, for example, ah, Gijs has just said that, and you say that, therefore, we can say that. So in the process, I use the same secret principle. I create those disturbing interactions that I then want to use for something else. So... In that sense, I think your comment is quite appropriate, um, except for the simple fact that it doesn't apply to you as a class, but it does apply to you as an individual. Each individual, and that is what I always consider the interesting thing about education, each individual is a source of variation. And very often in um, many different traditional forms of uh, education, the variation is reduced. People say, you know, listen to me. Uh, you say, listen to me and do what I say. That is what you create as a constraint, such that very often pupils um, say, I'm not interested in what you are saying, I'm going to look out of the window. So they create their own variation. And that's what I, when I teach um, in, in classrooms, what I use. Ah, Johnny is looking out of the window. Aha, <laughs> what can he tell us? Um, you know, you create the possibility for every individual uh, pupil to actually contrib contribute things outside the normal. Okay, okay, That's, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. But if I understand correctly what you are saying is that it is pointing to a certain, towards a certain method. Now I'm considering, I'm not considering the physical classroom, though it is uh, equally uh, applicable, but the, the, the method or the strategy that you are pointing at, it means that uh, me as the instructor, I have like an auxiliary and maybe not less important, even more important uh, a role as, as one that is creating by description opportunities 
within the within the instance or within the the process by reflecting like connecting what A said and what B said and connecting them in a certain manner and by that giving a direction to the, to, to the dynamics which is going on. Or even like, uh, okay, so uh, now uh, X seems to be distracted and I wonder what he or she are thinking about. <laughs> and by that to bring it into this uh, mutual space of what is going on um, yeah i see i see the i see the point of it as like weaving or knitting together this all uh, this all dynamism yeah you remember we had this discussion about the singing during the class that you use the disturb like in, you incorporate this disturbance into something functional for the for the process and and mm -hmm. indeed in the online uh, setting it's like so much more burdening for the teacher for the like the the host or the instructor of the event mm -hmm. because you have to pull out those events from what you see on screen basically and often on mute often only in like body language and so on and you give give it and like agency within the classroom which is like yeah. in, like kind of like projected yes yes it's, it um, it, yeah. it even starts to to seem to me just now I'm thinking about just I'm imagining is that this this teaching situation requires actually two persons to be like uh, leading uh, the teaching situation one of them is focused on keeping the direction of what are the goals of this class like a certain knowledge transfer or conversation etc while the other is like in this Greek dramas and Greek tragedies, is like the chorus that is describing what is happening. What is happening in the mental, emotional space of... Yeah. Of, uh, well. of everybody around. So it seems to me like a double, yeah. a double role. I'm not sure that it will be double, uh, like uh, two persons that will have to be there, but it's not, 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 not unthinkable. Double line. Yeah. Some people actually yeah. like to work in duos, exactly. Like for example, Ivona, Maciek and those guys there, like, the, like giving a training and they take the responsibility. One will be about the inputs and another one will be about the group process. And they, they just, yeah, they, they just pay their attention. Maybe okay. it's an elephant point. Mm -hmm. um, in the way I described it, I mean, this is just uh, my proposal in a sense. In the way I described it, I am not interested as a researcher in um, identifying the properties of each individual. I don't care whether you are intelligent or poetic or romantic or um, yeah, you want to maybe mentally disabled. <clears throat> you try to bring, a resource. You use every single response as a resource, yes. And so you don't care whether people are in different levels, et cetera, et cetera. If there is a very bright boy in the class, you use him. But you use him in such a way that he can be able to be bright in his own way. So you do not stop his being bright by saying, aha. <laughs> no. You challenge every single person by what the others are saying. Yes, this is uh, yeah. It's uh, it makes a lot of sense, but it's quite challenging also in in terms of given uh, given space and time constraints. But it makes a lot of sense to me. Now I have another question. Is but let's let's but move yeah, to the just second a moment, question. Yeah, yeah. You had another yeah. question. Yes. You had the second question, which was like, yes. Yeah. I'm ah, going yes. to answer to that. Yes. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I am running forward already. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait with this one because it's it's important. <laughs> well, um, if you have an instructor and a student, um, there are a number of ways of metaphors that you can use. And I say this again, it's not that I use a metaphor to organize the world. It's I use a metaphor to organize my knowledge acquisition process. So you get knowledge out of it. And so you can say, for example, suppose I take the metaphor, do what I say. 
then you can identify what type of knowledge uh, you can acquire in terms of what you can teach an individual pupil. So I would not say this <clears throat> is bad. I say, well, it's one way of identifying what you can actually teach using that particular metaphor. And you can teach a lot, I mean, um, but not to everybody as is well known. I mean, those of you who have uh, German as a second language probably had to learn all these lists of uh, mit nach mit, mit nach mit und so weiter. Um, I use those lists to understand what the list meant. But many of my uh, colleagues in the class, the other pupils, just learned them by, by uh, rote and use them. So in that sense, it was, you know, a very effective way of learning. But sometimes, observe what I do is very important in, for example, in technical situations in, uh, um, in, in oil platforms in, in the North Sea. Sometimes the situation is so dangerous that you cannot allow the other person to make a mistake. So you must make use the metaphor where you say, I can acquire knowledge by imposing on something, on somebody, a way of dealing with situations such that any danger is avoided. It's a different way. It's not better or worse. It's a different way. And sometimes you have to do that. As I say, in these platforms, sometimes you must not allow any mistake to be made because that will be death. But in many other situations, um, you're free to actually allow the other a person to use you as a stimulus for their own development. That's your last possibility. And sometimes that is what you want. I mean, Augustinus, uh, Augustine um, has this book, De Magistro, about the teacher. And he prescribes, uh, describes precisely this, this, do with me. He wants his son not to listen to him because he is the archbishop, etc. No, he wants his son to take what he is saying as material for his own development. And that, I would say, uh, means that what you proposed are three different metaphors, each of which actually makes it possible to acquire knowledge that supports that metaphor. So I make no choice. I do not say this is good, this is bad. It's just a metaphor that you can use to actually make it possible to acquire knowledge, even though the subject that you study is free to do anything. But sometimes it's a good teaching method. Do what I say. Well, sometimes it is not. And the being master of these metaphors allows you to say, aha, in this case, I'm doing this. In this case, I'm doing that. In this case, I'm doing that. So um, it was an, I, I participated in one of the, uh, Tasks in the Buckminster Day uh, on on, a, on was it Monday, mm -hmm. uh, which was the negative and positive feedback situation. Now, in itself, it was clearly um, a do what I do situation. It had nothing to contribute. That's not entirely true. It had a little bit to contribute because there was this game that you had to play and you had to identify and do yourself what might be the frame in which the game was constructed. So I thought it was a very nice uh, example of um, do with me, except for the last part, which was actually more do what I say. <laughs> so that's be my answer, uh, Raven. Mm -hmm. Yes. The <clears throat> One, one thing that I'm not sure um, that I was while listening to you right now is uh, uh, you started by, by reflecting of how each one of these metaphors uh, will project on a process of knowledge acquisition. 
Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me that in the educational, in the educational uh, event or the educational context, uh, it's, not only, it's not only the process of knowledge acquisition, it is what I would call a, a cognitive process that involves uh, the acquisition of information or knowledge, but also acting upon this knowledge. And, and, uh, and this is of course uh, a, feedback, uh, a feedback or an ongoing iterative uh, process that seems to me a bit more involved than just uh, observing and acquiring information because and, and this is what makes it more complex while, and I was thinking, okay, do what I say, like locates the, the person that, to whom I'm, I'm saying this, it locates, it locates him or her in a specific place within the process, is actually nice. being responsible to act, but not to introduce variations in perceptions and observations while do with me gives you the full the full uh, freedom of engagement where you introduce your own observation as a variation and also your uh, actual responses uh, the responses in action so it creates the whole uh, a situation which is more complex in the manner of cooperation or bringing together uh, more than one person, uh, 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 two persons or more together in something which is, which is coherent. And <clears throat> the thing, the, the thing that was, uh, uh, like I'm thinking uh, aloud now, is that I was asking you about the metaphors, but, but clearly the metaphors are already being preceded by certain, certain uh, observations or, or understandings, the conceptual understanding of what is the nature of the situation, what is what are we doing here? Yes. Yeah? So yeah. Mm -hmm. when we when we invent or imagine a school, okay, we have already this idea of, okay, students and teachers and parents and buildings or whatever, and the knowledge transfer, we have an already a pretty consolidated mental ecology where we start to operate what would be the metaphors that are, will be appropriate to our way of thinking about it. But, but then how can, we, how can we go even one step backwards and to examine our assumption of what's going on? What is education in the sense of what? <clears throat> Yes, I, I, I always, when, I, when I'm pressed to the corner in this, like being asked such questions, whether I'm asking myself or asked by others, I would always uh, draw the analogy between evolution and uh, uh, like a generalized evolutionary process and uh, cultural transfer as, as a starting point for education, but I'm not sure about it. This I, is if, if I can can uh, yeah, yeah uh, because yeah. I, I have I have a lot of to say about it, but but maybe like I would not jump yet. Uh, Hera, do you do you want to respond to? Well, uh, if I I can answer, and it's relatively important to answer. But if you wish, yes, please. No, I just I just wanted I, I just wanted to say like in the in terms of those this ecology I think like I just want to bookmark this question <laughs> because uh, the ecology of concepts and and so on because we we do need to have like a like a design you know session for this architecture of observation like what kind of patterns will kind of you know agree uh in the project that that will be the ones that we are basically it's it's not those like patterns in reality but patterns as as the like lens of observation that we are actually uh, interested in 
in uh, incorporating into like a, as a means of reflection in our practice and this will be our our research yes and and for that like i was also thinking evolution you know like when you had mentioned cybernetics and this, this those feedbacks and so on i don't know like i like i've been too much in in the cybernetics like to to like it anymore you know like, like oh, okay feedback feedback yeah, yeah. so so like if we were able like to replace cybernetics with something that would be actually this evolutionary frame that we are observing variations we are observing retentions uh and uh and movement between levels of that yes so for example when when a person starts to kind of edit their own selection making process i think it might be something like a you know like on, on the level of cybernetics i mean a replacement of, of, of this level logical level and then the question would be what we are observing within this by by this apparatus and i think those like doing together things and or other metaphors for learning is one thing but another central like bulk of of notions that we have on in our self description already is that we are working with trajectories individual trajectories Yes, that are accelerating, that are uh, divergent, and that they are asynchronous, which is like relative to what? Yes, always asynchronous relative to what? And and yeah, and and this kind of makes it kind of like a systemic type of like framework. So I would like I would apply this like uh, lenses of uh, evolutionary processes, cultural evolution, and so on, or like, like levels of evolution. To those trajectories, yeah, uh, and and to this um, and uh, and in in, the, in those different modalities of learning, if it makes makes sense. Well, <clears throat> um, okay. now I'm first going to say something which is probably difficult to understand, <laughs> um, but I just say it so I can refer to it later. Um, the notion of metaphor that I use may not be the notion of metaphor that you use or that Weaver use. Uh, a metaphor is a way of structuring whatever you say or see. Mm -hmm. But what I am actually saying is to use the metaphor as a metaphor, which is you use it as a tool. So you cannot say, for example, um, Okay, I'm going to treat this student as do what I say. You can do it, but then you use it as a metaphor. Whereas if you use it as a metaphor of a metaphor, then you say, okay, do what I say. Um, I'm now creating boundaries and you may escape or not. But my knowledge tells me how to make it possible for you not to escape. So you are not only doing something to other people and they may uh, reject or return or uh, resist. Uh, uh, no, you say, okay, we are going to do something such that what you do what I say, but I am aware of the possibility that you resist. And if you resist, then we can take that into consideration in do what I say. So it's the metaphor of metaphor that I am talking about. Um, the same holds for the traditional uh, mechanistic metaphor. You can say, okay, and people say that, I'm using the mechanistic metaphor and I assume, I take as given that reality is, is a metaphor. Whereas what I say is uh, said, but I accept it. This is the use of a metaphor. What I said was something different. I said, um, you use the metaphor to identify what it is that you want to see. And certain phenomena can be seen as a mechanism, but the thing that you see does not have to be a mechanism. So, for example, many people who, uh, let us say, play tennis can be seen as mechanism, including the fact that the, 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 the rules of the game identify that you do not escape the rules of the game. 
So you must be that. Now, once you have done that, you still have some freedom. And that's the interesting thing about playing a game. But if you use a metaphor simply in the sense of a metaphor, then you have no longer the ability to change. You have no alternatives. That's what you do. So in that sense, um, I have been thinking about this mechanistic metaphor very many times. And uh, it is possible to say, well, you know, the world is a mechanism. And then you, you have certain uh, laws that actually apply to knowledge. Knowledge must be and uh, must allow you to predict, for example. You can only do that if there is uh, a pattern. Uh, knowledge must not create new observations like in quantum mechanics. So it must not do that. Otherwise, it is not a mechanism and so on and so on. So I think that do what I say, if you know what you are doing and if you have done the research, then you can apply the research. That's what I would respond to uh, Viva. Um, then, you can, uh, then you can apply the research in such a way that you say, now you and I are doing such that you do what I say, and any deviation, variation, we agree that we will make supportive to what we are doing. I <clears throat> entirely, entirely agree. I, I must admit it was not that difficult. Yes, it was, <laughs> it was quite clear. <laughs> it was quite clear. And I, I, I want to add, I want to add uh, two points, like to augment, to augment your argument, is that uh, uh, two mistakes can be done about metaphors. Uh, one of them is forgetting that a choice of metaphor is only one you, you choose for a certain relevance and it's only, it's not a singular uh, choice. Very, very rarely, uh, it, you are you you find yourself forced to choose a certain metaphor out of many others so one mistake is to believe that your choice of metaphors is like a singular or unitary and the second one which is which is more common is what you were talking about is uh, is actually the the almost unperceivable movement from something that begins as a metaphor and becomes literal, meaning you forget that what you are doing is, is metaphorizing in order to navigate. And you start to believe that the metaphor that you are using is reality, it becomes literal. This is something that was indicated by, uh, in this book of James Silman, uh, the, the Jung, Jungian uh, psychologist, he said that, that pathology always appears when you take a metaphor and you use it as in a literal manner. Yes, it's a... Yes, no, no, that's an important point, but it implies the use of the metaphor. Um, and of course, if, if you take that as uh, not as something that you are going to explore, then you are fixed and you must assume yeah. It's and there are lots of people. I mean, there are people in the world who are scientists and say all organisms are mechanisms, and they believe it. Yes, but you and I can say sometimes I can treat them as mechanism, and sometimes I can treat them as intelligent, uh, interesting to talk to, interesting to interact with. For example, horses. People who ride horses do not just ride a horse, they talk to the horse. <laughs> yes. So they have ways of actually being able to constrain the way they interact in such a way that the horse feels trusted, is free to do what it wants, and still is willing to actually allow you to ride on it. I've seen some incredible um, videos of horse training where horses actually take the initiative to do all kinds of interesting exercises because they trust the, uh, the, the person who's sitting on them. So 
um, the metaphor, the use of the metaphor, is, somebody said maybe the word metaphor is too confusing. So he said, why don't you use the word imagination? You can imagine that the world is a mechanism. You can imagine that the world is a decision-making process. Mm. But, uh, it's not the same. Well, but you see what I'm talking about. Yeah. There is a difficulty in any type of language. And in this case, I would insist that what I mean is the metaphor used as a metaphor. And not the metaphor to organize my actions. No, it's the metaphor to constrain and use my freedom because there is no pattern in my uh, freedom. So I create a pattern in my freedom. And with that, I try to survive in evolutionary, evolutionary terms in a certain environment. And if I, uh, for example, I assume the metaphor, I'm a bully, um, then I try to survive and explore to what extent people actually uh, allow me to be a bully. And then at a certain moment, I have to understand that I can act as a bully if I'm sufficiently knowledgeable as a bully. <laughs> Certain people do it in a very nice way. So but you have to be aware of the resistance of the variation you create. So that was uh, about these three different things. I agree, of course, that Buckminster College um, is much more geared to acquiring knowledge about situations uh, where do with me is the basic metaphor. But do what I say is interesting. I think it's a very, very, very interesting approach, uh, Gerard. Thank you for this. Uh, in, from my opinion, it's one of the, um, or, or in, for my mind, it's one of the most interesting things that we had till now for uh, um, something that you really can use in in, 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 the, in the design of this educational uh, environment. Yeah. But but from 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 my side, what what is in, what is very interesting in the in, in the concept of these metaphors is is that there seems to be room for emotion. Um, oh yeah, which is which is sometimes lacking in, in 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 educational research, which is lacking in in school design, um, and it, there's also room in emotion. I think also in the design of of, of in the creation of a school as an institute, um, more than in, in just research. So without seeing it as a constraint, even even opinions in the during the creation of, uh, can be can be translate. You can translate opinions into metaphors in a certain way yes and and, and work with it um mm -hmm. rather than being constrained by the idea it is an opinion no it's not an opinion it's a metaphor and we can work with it so you you can create like a library of metaphors in order to um to do research and the 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 the, the, the interesting idea about about this this um like research is is, is more like it's like a process um where you where you understand the problem in a certain way, and um, using the metaphor is more is, is from for, from what I understand um, um, more like design rather than re doing research, doing design rather than research, like solving solving problems rather than understanding problems, and it gives it gives a, an an opportunity for not only uh, like a one directional but but also two two directional bi directional even multi directional conversation with between teacher and pupil uh, in a way by using this this concept of metaphors because if you if you have um the the idea of, of if you have the the metaphor okay do with me which i which i think is interesting or of, of what weaver says observe and observe me and do what i do it always seems to imply one way a uh, one-way uh, uh, direction. Like I'm, I, I have the knowledge. I already um, uh, incorporated that knowledge in my doing, and I will, uh, and and I transfer it to someone else. But I can, it can, and using this metaphors can create like a 
um, a, way, a way back, uh, like a way back machinery that uh, gives the teacher also the opportunity to learn and to to be taught uh, in yeah. a certain way, but also make the the pupil become a teacher for other pupils and mm. as such learn again. Um, yeah. So it's it's a very it's a very um, I, I like it very much. Um, it's 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 like the design of, of you you seem to design individual connections by using this metaphor concept, and but therefore also um, you create input input for others. Yeah. Um, at the same time, which is way uh, which which gives way more freedom in in. Um, from my point of view, in school design or in educational design, than just doing research and um, use the outcome um, as such. So I'm very grateful for this uh, for this idea. This, this this deviation that you're telling about also implies a certain open endedness um, in, in 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 what you're in, in the end. Well, there's not really an end result. So it's some, it's something that seems to be able to continue. Uh, and th this is very interesting. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, thank you for that, uh, Kira. It's, uh, it's really intriguing. Um, thank you. Um, maybe you take out some of the things that you are saying. Um, this notion of emotions. Yes, I think it's extremely important to be able to um, include the emotions as part of the freedom that you study. So in, in traditional research, you say exclude the emotions, but that doesn't mean that you exclude them. You exclude them just from the research. So people can, you know, uh, create a bomb and throw it somewhere. So the emotion is very different from what we hope that it is. Um, but you can also create interactions where the emotions um, I was discussing some of the work of uh, Deleuze and Guattari with people, and they know they they um, focus on the notion of a concept, but the notion of a concept is actually finding a pattern, and a pattern not in the world but in the way that you interact with the world. So the example was cogito ergo sum. Um, you might say, I think, therefore I am. But that's not what, what the whole concept is. It is suddenly something that actually creates the knowledge that you can be critical of yourself at the same time and therefore stand aside of yourself and therefore be a person. So it is, and that's why I mention it, I call this the poetic experience of understanding what cogito ergo sum means. Mm -hmm. And the poetic ex uh, experience is, of course, important also in the sense that uh, you made a distinction, still a distinction between research and design. But what I've been saying is actually people don't realize that research is a design process as well. You design the world that you study by saying and claiming that it is a, me a mechanism. I design the world of my love by saying that the lady I love is a wonderful person, um, goddess on earth. Um, well, whatever. And I can acquire knowledge to make her remain that way. Yeah, I understand. But I think that for me, the, 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 the concept of design requires emotion rather than research requires emotion. Yeah, but my point is that I'd like you to be aware that research is only one of the many different things. It, mm -hmm. It's only that which actually uh, assumes the metaphor of mechanism, but you have many other possibilities. So research, and that's the, 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 the message I give, is much wider. Mm -hmm. um, and an important part of that, uh, I forgot that was in the beginning of what you were saying, is that actually the metaphors um, do not have priority. There is no metaphor that is better than any other, which doesn't mean that you can prefer a metaphor, but there is no scientific way, given the metaphors, 
to make the claim that, for example, do what I say is a better metaphor or a worse metaphor than uh, do with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to create a bigger container metaphor within which you will compare the, the Yes, of course, this also depends on context and uh, goal orientation, because if you have an a priori goal, you can Yeah, start... but this is this bigger container, which is also a metaphor. Yes, kind of... you, and, then, and then it becomes a cognitive, uh, incorporated into a cognitive uh, process where, where uh, you choose for relevance. Yes, if you have a certain goal in mind, you can start to gradate uh, uh, metaphors according to their relevance in relation to a certain goal or set of or goals or a concept or uh, um, a, 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 another remark that I wanted to make, I'm reading now uh, Gilbert Simondon and he is noting that uh, emotionality and affectivity are always uh, there uh, between our perceptions and our actions. So when you when you apply when you apply this uh, way of thinking uh, of metaphors as constraining the world that we are operating in, uh, it becomes necessary to include also uh, this this uh, mediating layer of affectivity and emotionality uh, while if your only goal is to acquire knowledge this is not necessarily the case but if you want to create knowledge it also involves a, a, a selection of action in order to close a certain cycle of interaction yes emotions become a, necessarily become a part of the game. So I think. Well, no, I understand what you are saying and to some extent I agree with it, um, but it's a way of thinking where I agree, whereas what I'm proposing is a little bit more general. What I'm saying is if you have an emotion, it depends on your environment, on the constraints, what emotion you are free to have. So yeah some constraints do not allow you to be happy some constraints do not allow you to be unhappy so it is important to acquire the knowledge that allows you to make another person happy for example we have to download from you this one that uh, this allows you to be unhappy <laughs> <laughs> well, what i noticed uh, Gerard, in your uh, in your all in, in all your examples that you gave that um there always was uh, a certain a certain mingling of from an outside institution into an into an, an existing historical created uh, environment, like in this teaching environment, and that the 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 result was was um, self sort of sort of self organization um, mm -hmm. as a result of being provoked in a way. Yes. And this this is an interesting thing that, that 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 the result of this provoking became a positive thing. So they they were provoked by decisions by the government. So they 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 reflected to that by um, a, a certain reorganization or even self organization of the, and and solving the problem as such. Very good. Yes. No, it's provocation, um, not in the sense that you. Um, are ill-intentioned, but the environment that you have is a provocation as well. No? So most of the time people self-organize their, their environment. But what I am talking about is not that sometimes you are uh, you have a, an environment and it provokes, uh, provokes you to certain things, it leaves you free, but sometimes there might be a reason to change them. So research is not intended to do something about the existing situation. It's always supporting escape. Mm -hmm. You want to know something such that you can get out of the constraints. Mm -hmm. Amazing. It's a, it's a very, very nice uh, punchline for, for today. Uh, our, our time is up. So, so I should suggest we'll be 
we'll be finishing. Uh, thank you so much, Harold. I, I much enjoyed your uh, your seminar today. And we have to find, I don't know, you know, it's like always this problem with time and everything, you know, like have have actually time to to unpack those questions, you know, and, and start to design those things and, and start this research process for, for real, yes? And we'll, yes, uh, so. that's what we are here for. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. We created Buckminster College to do that. Yeah.